Hi, I'm Christy McDonald, and here's what's coming up this week on One Detroit. Adjusting to the reality of what school feels like this year with our local students, who are a part of the PBS NewsHour Student Reporting Labs. Plus, the plans for Afghan refugees headed to Michigan. Also, a closer look at the region's census numbers, growth and loss with our partners at Bridge Detroit. And then, a celebration of Detroit's boxing history. It's all ahead on One Detroit. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program is provided by the Cynthia Essel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV, the Kresge Foundation, Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan, the DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Also brought to you by, and viewers like you. Hi there, and welcome to One Detroit. I'm Christy McDonald. I'm so glad that you're with me this week as we head into October. Coming up on the show, we get a pretty frank assessment of what school is like for kids back in class this year from our local kids with the PBS NewsHour Student Reporting Labs. Plus, up to 1,300 Afghan refugees are expected to be resettled in Michigan in the coming months, how local nonprofits are working with the government to help. Then Will Glover checks in with our partners at Bridge Detroit with a closer look at the census numbers. And the new Ken Burns PBS documentary on Muhammad Ali had us reflecting on Detroit's storied boxing history. It's a report from American Black Journal. And it's all ahead this week on One Detroit. And we're starting off with a look at the school year so far from the kids' perspective. We have a group of local students from across Southeast Michigan who are part of the PBS NewsHour Student Reporting Labs. They bring us stories. They give us a true sense of how things are going on in the classroom. Their video diary assignment this week, share with us what concerns them about school this year. I'm most frustrated about the fact that school just hasn't been the same since COVID hit. And I get that there's nothing that you can do about it, but it's just really frustrating. As an in-person student, I think I concentrate doing a lot more on my studies. For the last six weeks of school, I was hybrid, going only once a week for two hours. So the change of now going to a completely different school and country is contributing to my struggle with the school year. Our school environment has changed dramatically from last year, as last year there were sanitizing stations everywhere, there were boxes of masks just out all over the place in every classroom, social distancing stickers on the floor, whereas now we don't have any of that. We can be mask free, um, we can see each other's faces, um, and it's for the better. I'm kind of frustrated about that there's no mask mandate just because I would be more comfortable if people wore masks. I'm frustrated that kids aren't taking it super seriously. I mean, I definitely think that it is a little bit safer than it once was, but people are acting like it's not a problem at all anymore, which I don't think that's true. I'm most worried about the quarantining and specifically for sports, just all the rules that are set in place is if like, even if you're just a contact, like you have to quarantine for 10 days and like for a sports team, if one person get like gets it, that's multiple kids on the team that you're going to lose for your next game. I wish they understood that um, it doesn't feel safe to be in a room with 30 other kids who might as well be, cover be carrying the coronavirus. It's incredibly stressful. I never stop thinking about it. It's, it's kind of hell. I think it's most frustrating that adults, they want us to like all stop wearing masks and everything and they act like it's like the worst thing ever, which I mean, I, most students I feel like don't care. Like, we'll, we're fine with wearing masks, it's not a big deal, and they play it up to seem like a huge thing. I wish the adults making our decisions for our district focused more on mental health and our resources, because oftentimes when students are put into lockdown, their overall mental health decreases. 
and something that's been really bothering me about this time is just the adults because although they're going through the exact same thing we are they're not as vulnerable to it because we're still developing and we don't have as much control over as li our lives as they do this hasn't been an easy adjustment for everyone, so we'll continue to check in with our student reporters as the year goes on. All right, turning now to preparing for Afghan refugees that are resettling in Michigan over the next few months. Our One Detroit contributor, Nolan Finley, spoke with Steve Tabachman up at the Mackinac Policy Conference a few weeks ago. Steve is the executive director of Global Detroit, an organization that focuses on immigrant inclusive strategies. What can we expect in Michigan, and particularly in Detroit, in terms of the of, of people arriving here and settling here? In, so there are about 50,000 Afghan arrivals mm -hmm. who will be coming. Uh, very few actually will be refugees. There's a whole bunch of other mm -hmm. statuses. So mm -hmm. we have the SIVs, those right. who have already been cleared to, for helping the military. But the newcomers. Yeah, the newcomers. Mm -hmm. So of the 50,000, we already know that we're getting in the state of Michigan roughly 1,300. Mm -hmm. And we'll see 320 come to Wayne, Oakland, Macomb counties. Mm -hmm. And um, so a portion of that 320 will be in Detroit. And they'll be arriving in the coming weeks, like literally in, uh, by the end of October, we'll have our first arrivals. Now, I wrote a column recently when, after the Afghan wave uh, starter. It looked like it was coming that this real opportunity for Detroit, a city that needs more residents, as evidenced by the census count, uh, why not concentrate those refugees and immigrants in a, in a specific area where they can build strong communities and support networks for themselves. Well, you're exactly right. And Mayor Duggan is in support of this uh, mm -hmm. concept. Um, his office, his Office of Immigrant Affairs, uh, has been coordinating that kind of response. Now, we mm -hmm. did this about five years ago when the Syrian and Iraqi numbers were very high and uh, brought a number of families to um, the Cote Rouge neighborhood. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that worked out well for those arrivals. Um, we need to, when we plan those kinds of arrivals, particularly the Afghan arrivals, which will only have 90 days of supports from the government and oh. they'll really be on their own. Um, we need to talk about the school system, the transportation system, the housing, the economic mm -hmm. opportunity, small business supports, language access. So there's a whole array of supports that needs to be mm -hmm. put in place in concentrating them in a neighborhood where it might be more walkable, uh, where, there's, where there are uh, housing that can be filled, makes an infinite amount of sense. Um, and we have that in Detroit. We do. And, um, you know, Global Detroit just uh, last month came out with a building inclusive cities uh, study at buildinginclusivecities.org. Mm -hmm. You can find the study that looked at the uh, Chadzi Condon and Bangletown neighborhoods and what's happened there in the last 20 years with rapid immigration growth. And what we found was that African American families and longtime Detroiters have seen quality of life improvements. Mm -hmm. They've seen their population growing, they've seen uh, less vacant housing, decreases in crime. Uh, uh, more stores opening up. Uh, and so this is a good thing, not just for refugees and arrivals, but also for longtime Detroit. So a lot of people look at immigrants and, and immigration, and particularly when waves of refugees come in. They look at that as a burden on the country, going to come in, take jobs, take opportunities, uh, suck social services. Um, you see it as an economic opportunity at your organization. I mean, I think that refugee policy, you know, it is a lot of humanitarian policy. Mm -hmm. You've got to think through natural security and all these other issues. But from an economic standpoint, the evidence is clear that refugees help build communities. They help create jobs, as, as Rick Snyder was found of saying around immigrants. Mm -hmm. We looked with the Ford School of Public Policy the last uh, 10 years of arrival. In 2016, we did our study. And those refugees who had come that, that decade, about 22,000 to Southeast Michigan, yeah. produced about $250 million in annual economic activity through their spending. And so they've really helped a lot of communities, not just Hamtramck, but a lot of interrig suburban communities, Macomb County communities, um, to really strengthen their economy and grow. How well prepared are we to support these Afghanis when they arrive? I mean, we're as well prepared as any region in the country. I think the country as a whole, this happened way faster than anyone yeah, anticipated. Right. <laughs> and so with simply 90 days, there's a lot that we have to build. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have some good partners on the ground, Mayor Duggan, uh, the State of Michigan's Office of Refugee Resettlement, Global Michigan, Global Detroit, and all of our refugee resettlement agencies. So how long before they can decide whether they want to stay here or move to another place in America? They, they'll actually be applying for asylum status after they come here. And they will have to find lawyers that 
that can help them with that process. Wow. So we have, there's a lot to be worked out. Uh, this is historic in nature. It's not dissimilar to mm -hmm. the Cuban boat lift or uh, letting the Haitian refugees in, you know, uh, 50 years ago. And so, mm -hmm. uh, so it's going to be a whole new experience, whole new chapter. There's going to be a lot of, of chapters to go through before we find the end of the story. But when you look at, at, at immigration and particularly this sort of refugee immigration as a means of rebuilding a population base, it's one tool. It absolutely is one tool. It's, it's how we came, became uh, the fourth right. largest city in America at mm -hmm. one point uh, in Detroit, and it's what uh, we can do in the 21st century to grow the population. And uh, it's what other cities, Philadelphia, et cetera, that have turned the corner from population loss. Immigration has been a central part of that. The census numbers are out, and our partners at Bridge Detroit took a closer look at two cities, Hamtramck and Highland Park. Both are surrounded by the city of Detroit, but have very different shifts in population. Will Glover talked with Bridge Detroit reporter Nushrat Rahman to find out why one is seeing growth and the other isn't. Can you just give us a general overview? What, what are the numbers with uh, Detroit overall? And then we'll drill down a little bit into a couple of the cities that you covered specifically. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the census is always such an interesting time because every 10 years we get this like data dump of just uh, just an immense amount of information. Um, and it tells us a lot about what's going on. Um, so for Detroit, for example, um, for yet another decade, we saw a population decline. So, um, you know, the 2020 census showed us that there were about 639,000 um, Detroiters in the city. Um, that's a decline from 10 years ago, but that's not anything new. Like I said, this has been happening. I believe this is like the se seventh decade that this has happened. When it comes to cities like Detroit, other places around the state, usually there are some trends or some examples of cities that, you know, kind of give us uh, an overall view of what's going on around us in a lot of places. And um, one of the two of the cities, rather, that you looked at specifically were Hamtramck and Highland Park, is that correct? Yep. Mm -hmm. So d give me an overview as to what happened there and then we can talk a little more about it. Yeah, it's really interesting because Hamtramck and Highland Park, they're two different cities um, with their own city councils and city government with their own dynamics, but they're both engulfed by the city of Detroit. And so what we saw um, in the last 10 years was this kind of you know, population shift where one grew um, by a large amount and the other shrank. So Hamtramck, for example, um, the population grew by 27%. That's roughly 6,000 people. And a city that's pretty close to it, Highland Park, shrank by 24%. That's 2,800 um, people. And so that many people left the city. So you kind of see these very stark population shifts where one city grew and the other shrank. There were booming industries that existed in these cities and then they left and then it took the tax base with it, right? And so that's kind of a similar story to what happened in Highland Park. You had Model Ts that were being made there. You had Chrysler, you had these booming industries. And then, you know, in the 1970s and the 1990s, these industries left and people left with them. Um, and that kind of started that decline. Um, a lot of people I talked to said that they lack a lot of, they lack city services, right? Um, they don't have function functioning streetlights. Um, there are, you know, overgrown um, properties. It's just a difficult place to live in in that regard. Um, the schools are decimated. That's something that I heard over and over again is that, you know, there aren't that many, there aren't schools for students to go to. And so you have a bunch of these various factors, whether it's the fact that there aren't streetlights, whether it's the fact that, you know, there aren't schools, um, there aren't city services, combine all of that together. And those are some of the reasons that people may have felt like they wanted to leave the city. When it comes to Hamtramck, they're going in a different direction. So what was the, you know, the driving force behind their growth in population? What I kept hearing in my conversations um, with, with people is that immigration is a big driver of it. And this has been the story of Hamtramck for decades, right? 
you know, several decades ago, you had um, German immigrants who came and then Polish immigrants and then Bangladeshi immigrants and Yemeni immigrants who came and, and found Hamtramck as a place to get their start. Um, I had one person um, who I talked to, he's lived in um, Hamtramck for, for a couple decades now. And he said Hamtramck is a landing port for, for new immigrants, right? It's that place where you come, you get your job, um, you make money, you start businesses um, and you get your start here. Some people move out to the suburbs, but other people find a place to stay here. Um, and so that was one of the main reasons that a lot of people I talked to contributed to the population growth. You have people coming from Bangladesh, um, which is a country next to India. You have people coming from, from Yemen. Um, and so there's a huge um, amount of immigrants um, that, that live in this city um, and whose families live here as well. That was one of the main things I heard over and over again is that you know, there's a sense of community. Um, I talked to one person who said that, you know, it's a two square mile city. I can go to the mosque. I can walk to the mosque. I can go to the grocery store. I don't necessarily need to drive there. I can just, you know, walk there. Everything is within that radius, right? Um, there's that convenience factor. There's that community factor. Um, and so those were some of the driving factors. But overwhelmingly, like I said, immigration was something that kept coming up. Last month, PBS launched a new documentary on Muhammad Ali by Ken Burns. Muhammad Ali was one of the most celebrated athletes of all time. And it gave us a chance to take a look at Detroit's own rich history in the sport of boxing. The city has produced numerous champions, Joe Lewis, Thomas Hearns. From the famous Kronk Gym to the city's Golden Gloves tournament, Detroit has always been a training ground for some of the best amateur and professional boxers around. Marcus Green from American Black Journal gives us a look at the city's celebrated boxing scene. It made me very happy to, to be from the Detroit Cup because Detroit support me so well. I couldn't do I, I couldn't do number one win because I love the feel. I love the I love the the feel. I love the emotion that, that, that Detroit put into everything for me. They showed me how to what it was like to be a champion in Detroit. And what I learned what it was like to be a champion in Detroit is just a wonderful thing, a great feeling. So I didn't really know that much about boxing except for Muhammad Ali because when I started high school, he won the Olympics. He got the gold medal in 1960. So that's what got me aware of boxing as a sport. I followed his career because I thought he was so interesting. And then when I got involved myself in boxing, working with Tommy Hearns and the Kronk Gym in 1978, I was impressed at how much I thought Thomas Hearns reminded me of Muhammad Ali. His slick moves, his dominance in the ring, his personality, although he wasn't making up poems and rhymes, I could see a similarity in their greatness. You just see greatness in certain people. And so, as it turned out, unbeknownst to me, we would all be coming together in the early 80s because Muhammad Ali owned a company called MAPS, which was Muhammad Ali Professional Sports. And they ended up promoting some of Tommy Hearns' fights, his title fights. And so I finally got to meet this amazing man. I was writing for a daily paper as a journalist and I did an interview with Thomas Hearns very early on in his career. And as I did with Muhammad Ali, I fell in love with this fighter who was so gracious and so uh, humble, but so great in the ring. And I admired that so much. And then when I had the opportunity to work with him and learn the sport from a different angle, not just as a fan, but actually spending time in a gym and watching what it takes to become a professional fighter, you don't play boxing. It, it is a sport, but it's a hard sport, one-on-one, -on -one, and you have to put so much into it. And I have so much respect for the people that do that, men or women, that take that sport on. I was watching TV one day, and Muhammad Ali came on TV, and he started boxing, and he went there and was just saying all kinds of stuff and beating his man, beating his opponent up. And I thought that was, that was nice, that was, that was special, that was different. Becoming the first man in boxing history to win titles in, in seven different divisions, 
uh, that's a, that's a big achievement myself. And, and then win all the titles that I won. Uh, um, that was um, winning titles is not an easy thing to do. The state of Michigan, that's our bragging rights. Other than you know baseball, anything, we won more championships than all sports in boxing. You know, and everybody, else, you only know Tommy Earn. That's all. It was more champions than Tommy Hearn. And I are in the 80s with Crunk, with Tommy Hearn, John McKinney, you know. We, I thought we was, we was rougher than a lot. I mean, I mean, I mean, it's a thick that comes that we was rougher than a lot of people. We, when you fought somebody from Crunk, you know, they came to fight. And from Detroit, Crunk, they came to fight. My uh, great uncle box, my uncle box, my brother box. So by the age of four, I was introduced to boxing just early at that age. That's an early age, right? So I know boxing. Uh, I remember four, uh, my brother doing 100 push-ups, me working out with my brother, five, six, seven. Uh, my uncle, he was involved with the uh, crunk gym. Around that era was Thomas Hearns, Milt McCorry, Stephen Corey, part of the whole crunk at Scott team. It was just like normal, you know, but stepping outside of Detroit, it's a big thing, it's a huge thing. I think here in the Detroit area, we've produced more world champions than any other state. All you have to do wherever you're traveling in the world, it doesn't matter whether you're in boxing or you're on vacation or whatever, and you sit down to have a sandwich or a drink and someone sits next to you and strikes up a conversation and you say, they say, where are you from? I'm from Detroit. The next question that comes out of their mouth, oh man, can you tell me about Detroit boxing? Can you tell me about the Cronk Gym? Can you tell me about James Tony? You know, that's the first thing people from out of town will ask you once you tell them that you're out, you know, you're from Detroit. I mean, we all box each other hard. We are Durrell, Tommy, Elmer, everybody that was in that area, yeah. We all box each other hard. But nobody got bragging rights on us. For me, having them guys in my in my camp, camp at the same time I was in the gym. Well, that was the best thing for me because them guys helped me become who I am. Them guys put the hard work in as well as I put the work in. Detroit gonna keep coming. Like, like Detroit is not gonna like bag up, sit down, none of that. Detroit, if they fight the best, they 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 gonna work for it. You know what I'm saying? They ain't gonna, oh, I'm fighting the best. I don't want to. Like, whatever you put in front of them, that's what they gonna do. You know what I'm saying? They gonna fight whoever, even win, lose, or draw. They gonna fight them. It don't matter who it is. When Detroit boxers box, they box. They, they passionate. You know, uh, literally, we go hard. Like, being from Detroit, I know this is about myself. I go hard at everything I do. My work, my professional. It's something about that Detroit spirit. So it's not a negative. It's a positive. I think Detroit boxers are tough just because of the way they come up. It's an industrial city. It's a blue-collar city. And I think there's a lot of young talent here. There always has been. And I think that these kids today that go into the gyms that want to fight, it's a great way to get them off the streets. And it teaches them discipline, self-defense. You certainly have to be on your game if you're going to fight. You're not on a team. It's just one against one. And Detroit's been known to have tremendous talent. Being involved in, with the Metro Detroit Golden Gloves, I was able to see on a national level Detroit and boxing. Detroit is just a whole, we, we just, we have a whole different vibe. It's, it's different. So it's unexplainable. I can explain it. I think it's just the spirit of Detroit. It was very uplifting to come to the Golden Gloves this year and see how that, how much uh, the new officers have brought up the organization over the last few years. I'm very, very proud of the work that they've done. And uh, I, I see in the future, if this is going to happen, that uh, we're going to go back to the old days where we used to have two or three rings with uh, two or three bouts going on at the same time. One of the things back here, you go back to the 70s and the 80s where Detroit boxing was dominant in the world. And the reason for that was we had a great amateur program. And from the amateurs, they were going into the pros. And I see a, a rejuvenation of that happening. I see a great amateur program that's going on right now. And it's just a matter of time before they go into the pros. And I think in the next five years, uh, Detroit boxing will be dominant on the world boxing scene again. For more from American Black Journal and all of the stories that we are working on, just head to our website at OneDetroitPBS.org.
All right, we're going to leave you with a tribute to one of the most influential lawyers and deal makers here in Detroit. Attorney Henry Baskin passed away at the age of 88. If you were in the TV or entertainment business, you knew Henry. He represented everyone from Dick Purton to Jerry Hodak to Marvin Gaye and The Temptations, as well as our own Detroit Public TV CEO, Rich Homburg. As a favor to a friend, he even looked over one of my early TV contracts and gave me advice on my next move when I started out in the business. Henry also did a show called Due Process that aired right here on Detroit Public TV. He served on the Michigan Judicial Tenure Commission and Oakland University Board of Trustees. Our very best to Henry Baskin's family. You can find more at OneDetroitPBS.org or subscribe to our social media channels and sign up for our One Detroit newsletter. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program is provided by the Cynthia and Edsel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The Kresge Foundation, Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Also brought to you by, and viewers like you.